in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the expanse sky. And there was evening. And there was morning. The second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. And let dry ground appear. The dry ground he called land and the waters he called seas. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation. And the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind and trees bearing fruit. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning. The third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them mark the seasons and the days and the years. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem, every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all that he had made and said it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Friends, that is the biblical account of the creation of of the world. And whether you believe it to be a true day-by-day -day account or some poetic representation of it, the fact is this account is how God has intentionally and specifically chosen to deliver that account to us. And the thought of that, the reading of that, should cause every one of us to pause. And here's why. Because God is not bound by time. God does not live in time. God doesn't wake up in the morning and go to bed at night. God doesn't X off the dates on the calendar counting down the days to Christmas. God doesn't count the seconds in the minutes and the minutes in the hours and the hours in the day. God does not live bound by time. And when was the last time you ever heard God got tired? When was the last time you ever heard that God needed to rest? Listen, you're not going to go to God and say, hey, God, you know, I've got this really, really big dilemma in my life. or I've got this really, really huge decision I've got to make for my life. God, can you and I just talk about it for a while? And God's going to God say to you, you know what? Can we just put it off till tomorrow? Because I am just beat I can't, I can't do another thing today. God, that's not God. 
God does not live bound by time, and God never needs to rest. So why? Why would God choose to deliberately give us this amazing account of creation with both of those things in it, time and rest? Here's why. Because although God does not need, is not bound by time and does not need to rest, He knows that you are and that you do. God knows how you live. God knows how you work. God knows you work hard, at least some of you. You work hard. And sometimes we forget when to stop. You work hard and God knows what that does to you. There's this thing called stress, right? And so God, knowing that you work in time, knowing that you work sometimes against time and that stresses you out, he wants you to be your best, so he stresses rest. Did you know that nearly 80% of Americans are stressed? That may not surprise you. You work with them, you live with them, you see them every single day. That's according to a 2017 study by Gallup Surveys. Now, on, on the good side of things, um, they did figure out that Technology is helping us as Americans not to be so stressed. They found out that the fact that you can um, shop online, bank online, date online, and even work online, so you don't have to go to the office, right? You can work from home. That those things through technology save us a ridiculous amount of time, so that de-stresses Americans. Because time, for us, we work against time so often, that's what stresses us out, so they save us time these devices, but they also found out that technology does also add stress to our lives. The fact that you are constantly uh, under barrage by all the news feeds, you know, Fox News, CNN, all those coming in, uh, and also the fact that you just feel obligated to keep up with everybody's story in the world, so you sit there reading them forever, right? That those things stress us out. So technology is kind of a bust, you know, sometimes it helps us, sometimes it hurts us, but the reality is you and I live bound in time, and we work against time and in time, and so we are stressed out. And here's the way stress manifests itself. Three ways they tell us it manifests itself in your life. Anger, anxiety, and fatigue. None of those things are God's best plan for your life. So, so God has given us this account of creation where he has kind of written down for us and modeled for us in, in written form and spoken form how to work, but how to rest in time. But God will do you one better. See, God believes, like, like we believe, I think God knows that we believe that talk is cheap. And so God didn't just write it down and, and have it spoken there for us. God went further. He came to earth as a man. He was born as a baby, grown as a man. His name is Jesus. And when Jesus walked on this earth, he demonstrated for us how to work hard, but how to rest. See, here's the thing. When, when, when Jesus was in heaven, he didn't need to rest as God in heaven, but God on earth, he needed to rest. See, Jesus was always on. Jesus was always busy. Jesus was always in demand. Hey, Jesus, come visit us over here. We need your help over here. Hey, Jesus, my son, he twisted his ankle in Jerusalem soccer team. So can you help him out? And hey, Jesus, my mother-in-law, I think she's possessed by a demon or 10. So can you come cast them out? You know, so Jesus was always, there were very few moments where Jesus wasn't being asked to do something for someone. For example, there was a time, a day, when Jesus was up in the area of Capernaum, and that's a town up near the Sea of Galilee, and that was Peter's hometown. Peter and Andrew were brothers, so it was their hometown, John and James, who were in the fishing business with them. So they, they lived in this town ca called Capernaum, and Jesus and was up there with his apostles, and it was the day of Sabbath. It was, it was their, their worship day, their go-to-church day. And so, as was his custom, Jesus went to church. They went to the synagogue to worship. And since he was a visiting, traveling rabbi, they said, hey, will you teach today? And so Jesus stood up and he taught. And while Jesus was teaching, all the people who were there were like, wow, this is so amazing. We've never heard anything like this. And then there was a guy in synagogue that day who was possessed by a demon. And so Jesus cast that demon out of him, and all the people were like, wow. This is amazing. We've never seen anything like this. So that when they walked out of church and they went home that day, they just kept talking about it. Like, that was an amazing church day. That was so great. 
And Jesus, being the preacher of the day, was like the last one to leave. That's what pastors are always the last one to leave. And so he walks out, and he's got his apostles with him, and they go from the synagogue back to Peter's house. Now, can you just imagine what that may have been like? I don't know if, if Peter had his work buddies over there before or not, but he's got them all that day. Hey, come on back to my house. We'll get some lunch. And they walk into Peter's house, and we know Peter was married because his mother-in-law was there. I can imagine how that may have gone, kind of a little weird, like, hey, mom, this is God, and God, this is my mother-in-law, which you knew that already, so yeah. So I don't know what conversations took place, but when they walked in, his mother-in-law had a fever. So Jesus goes back on the clock, he goes over, he heals her, she gets up, she makes them something to eat, and so they spend, you know, whatever time in the afternoon uh, eating this meal and maybe relaxing a little bit. Maybe watching the Steelers beat up in the Patriots, watching that rerun from last weekend. Woo! And so, so they're doing these things. And then before long, it's sundown. And the moment it's sundown, it's on the door. Because sundown was the end of Sabbath. The Sabbath day was over. And that meant that people in the town and people in that area could now do after sundown what they were not allowed to do all day long, but they wanted to. They wanted to keep going back to see Jesus. So at sundown, there's a knock on the door, and someone from inside the house goes, and they, they open the door, and there's this, all these people. There's this crowd of people filling the porch, flooding over the porch, down all through the front yard, just filled with people, down the sidewalk, down both directions of the street, every street they could see. In fact, the, the writer Mark tells us the entire town was gathered at Peter's front door. And they're all saying, like, hey, Jesus, can you keep doing for us tonight what you did this morning at church? And so Jesus goes out and he starts preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons. And it just went on for hours. And, and some of you have seen that. Like if you were on team when we were over in Uganda, I had the privilege of preaching. And church there lasts like two, two and a half, three hours. But when church is over, church happens. Like church stopped, but then church just kept going because for another two or three hours, people were just, hey, can you pray for us? Pray for my child, do this, do that, teach some more. So we, we, we've seen that happen. This is what was happening when Jesus was out in front of Peter's house. So for hours and hours throughout into the evening, into the night, he's healing and teaching and doing all the, that the people need him to, to, to do. And then everybody finally is taken care of. All their needs are met. All those people go back home. And Jesus finally closes the door. And he goes to bed. He gets a little bit of sleep early in the morning. Jesus wakes up before anybody else while it's still dark out. And he goes out to a quiet place to pray. He goes out there just to get away. And, but it didn't last long. Because before long, he hears voices. Voices he knows. Voices he recognizes. It's Peter and a couple of the other apostles. Like, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where are you? And they find him. They come to him. And you know what they said? Jesus. We've been looking everywhere for you. Where have you been? People are coming back to the house. People are all through the front yard again. The whole crowd is back, but this time it's not just the people from our town. It's people from all the other towns. See, people are so amazed at what Jesus did. They went out and told the other towns, and people are flocking in from all over. Like, business is booming. And so, once again, even before breakfast, Jesus clocks back in, goes on duty, and begins to heal all these people. Jesus understood what it meant to work hard. He wasn't immune to getting tired. Jesus never got tired of the work, but Jesus certainly got tired in the work. And those are two different things you need to understand the difference between those things. Jesus got tired in the work. As a man walking on this earth, Jesus got tired. He needed to rest. And if you watch him, if you watch what, what God told us in creation and how God lived his life on earth as a man, you'll see Jesus' model right here, a rhythm of rest. And this morning, I'm going to show you that rhythm of rest. And to make it easier to understand and maybe even easier to remember, I'm going to give it to you in a form of an acronym. Okay? SOAR. S-O-A-R. And that's on your, your sermon note sheet. So grab that out. Find a pen. Get ready to write. Because we're going to come right up to the first fill-in right here. 
So looking back at the creation story and also seen from Peter's house, let me show you this rhythm of rest that God wants you to understand for your life. The very first letter S simply stands for this, stop, stop. That's all it is. Step back. Step back from the pressures and the stressors and the, and the duties and the dangers of this life. Listen, there's nothing wrong with hard work. In fact, God has some really choice words for people who don't work hard. If, if you're able to work, but you don't work and you don't work hard, God's got some really interesting labels for you like lazy, sluggard, sloth. He even says that you know, if you can work and you don't work, you don't deserve to eat. I mean, God didn't mince words on this. God chooses to believe hard work is important. And he got that. I mean, he, he created the universe in six days. He gets hard work. So hard work isn't wrong. Hard work isn't bad. But, but look at what God did in creation. He chose to work hard. Like every day, he started out with his work list for the day. He said, let there be. Let there be light. Let there be sky. Let there be ground. And it was so. But when he accomplished his hard work, he stopped. He didn't do tomorrow's work today. He finished the work of the day, and he stopped. How many of you know people who don't know how to stop? I do. I'm married to one. She's a hard worker. She makes me look lazy. How many of you in your own life have forgotten how to stop? Man, I think about that often. God does not intend us to work, work, work. Now, our culture is different. Do you know we are the hardest working, longest hours working nation in the world? Americans are. We have forgotten what it means to stop. Listen, you cannot be a slacker and do what God did. But he set the model for us, work hard, but then stop. There was evening, there was morning, another day. Here's a second step in soar. Number two is observe. When you stop, look around. Look around at what you've done. Look around what you've accomplished. This is exactly what God did. God stopped and God saw. God created, he stopped, and he saw. And, and here's the thing. When God, when God saw, when he looked, he didn't look at the things he hadn't done. He looked at the things he had done. Have you ever had those days when you start out? Like I start out every most days. I look at my, my phone, and I've got my to-do list, right? Have you ever had those days you look at your to-do list at the beginning of the day? Then you look at it at the end of the day, and it's longer, right? In fact, the things you were supposed to get done, you didn't, and they just got added. More things got added to it, right? We all have those days when, when we don't get through everything we're supposed to, to get through, it's hard sometimes to, to look at, at what you've done if you haven't done as much as you think you should have done. Listen, when God stopped and he observed, he looked at what he had accomplished, not at what he had not accomplished. He let it be evening and he let it be morning, knowing another day was coming. I hope we can learn to do the same. When you stop, Take time to observe what you've accomplished. Here's number three, appreciate. Now, let's just confess this is easy for God. Everything that God made was just fantastic, right? What God did, God did really, really good. Like the sun, the moon, the oceans, the mountains, the plants, the animals. Like who, went, who would not look at the freshness of new creation and just, uh, just appreciate how great it was? When I was a kid... My mom knew that every time we went to the big store, that was Kmart. Remember Kmart? Yeah, Kmart, that I was going to, when she went shopping, I was going to go and stay in the pet section. I mean, they had a legit pet section in our Kmart in Butler back in the day when it was safe for you to say, hey, kid, you go over there while I go do my shopping. I, I would go, I would just watch, I'd count the fish, and look at the hamsters, the gerbils, whatever they had. And, uh, and I've always been a sucker for like going to pet stores because I like to look at the, the puppies especially. I'm just a, a dog guy. Can you imagine watching the first dog ever created run through the first day of creation? 
Can you imagine the fun that would be if you're a dog person? Come on, like watching a brand new dog explore a brand new world. Who wouldn't appreciate that? Then you've got all the aromas and all the sights and all these brand new sounds. Who wouldn't appreciate what God had done? You know, I love how one theologian put it. He said, do you you think that God just like waved his hand over a meadow and all the flowers just appeared at once? Or do you think that God maybe like grew just one daisy and he looked at it and he he felt the texture of its leaves and he, he, he smelled its petals and he saw the beautiful colors he'd made in it and he went, that's gorgeous. I'm gonna make another one. And he made another one and another one. He appreciated it. And by the way, do you know that's what God does with you? God could have just made everybody the same. God just waved his hand. Let there be a bunch of people. But you know what? God says, you know, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I made you unique and special. See, God values you just for who you are. You see that all through creation. God appreciated what he made. Over and over again, it reads, it was good. But again, that's easy. That's easy for God because everything God made was beautiful. And sometimes your work is good too, right? Sometimes you get to the end of the day and like, man, I'm going to sign my name to this day because it was absolutely perfect. Man, I got done when I needed to get done. My stuff was good today. But then, don't you have those other days when the best thing you made was mistakes, When the best thing you made was a mess, like that decision didn't pan out, that relationship didn't work out, Um, maybe that new job didn't 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 play out, your your temper ran out, you burnt dinner, so now you got to go out. Like you look back at your day, and like nothing I did today was good. What what do you do with that? How do you appreciate that kind of a day? Or I I don't know. There there are days where my my agenda that I start out with is hijacked by people. Like, so I don't accomplish anything, it feels like, on those days. And you do that, right? You have kids, you have parents, you've got neighbors and coworkers and people who who just kind of take over your entire day, and then you get all the social media blasting your day and taking your time. How do you you appreciate those days? Well, those are the days you just lean into Jesus. Those are the days you trust and rest in in Jesus. Those are the days where you remember that, you know, it's going to be evening and morning, and there's another day that's coming. Here's the last one, number four. After you stop, observe, and appreciate, number four, you recover. You physically recover. You mentally recover. When God stopped and God observed and God appreciated, then God recovered. Now, he didn't actually need to rest each of those days, but he modeled it for us because we need to. There was evening and there was morning. That's a rest time that God has built into every single day for us. But even beyond that, like after all that work of creation was done, God did for six days hard work. On the seventh day, he rested. Now, the word for that day is Sabbath. And the literal meaning of that is to rest from labor. But here's what the Jews did. The Jews, uh, the Jewish nation, they, they took that Sabbath idea and they began to build all their ideas around it. And they came up with some really, really kind of quirky laws around the Sabbath day. For instance, did you know you were only allowed to walk a certain distance on the Sabbath day? It was conveniently called a Sabbath day's walk or a Sabbath day's distance. And that distance, by their law, was just about half a mile. So if you walked more than half a mile in a day on the Sabbath, then you were guilty of breaking the law. You were guilty of sin. So what if I leave my house and I'm wandering around and I just all of a sudden realize, dang, I'm a, I'm a half mile from home. What do I do now? I can't walk back. So some other rabbi said, oh, well, we think you can. We think it's half mile one way so you can walk half mile back. And some didn't disagree with that. It was just one of those quirky laws. You also could not, on the Sabbath, you could not pick up your mat and carry it across the middle of town. Well, can I go around the side streets of town? Because I'm kind of confused. Quirky laws. Did you know? that Jesus got in trouble for healing on the Sabbath. Like there was this guy with his withered hand came into the synagogue and Jesus said, hey, let me me heal you. And he healed him. And the religious leaders were like, oh, you're in so much trouble. And and Jesus was like, not really, I'm God, but I'll play along, right? And and so so they get him in, in trouble 
for healing on the Sabbath. But Jesus used that, that incident to teach them something amazing. He said, don't you know that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath? See, they, they had put such stringent laws on it that they weren't allowed to do hardly anything on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, let me turn that on its head. God didn't give you the Sabbath so you can't do anything. He gave you the Sabbath so you don't have to do anything. He gave you the Sabbath so you can rest, so you can recover, so you can recharge your mental and physical and emotional and relational batteries, and you can reobserve better, healthy boundaries. So here's what you do on the Sabbath. You come to worship. Then you go, maybe go for a family hike. You can even go more than half a mile. Maybe go home and play catch with your son. Maybe go, um, go ride bikes with your daughter. Maybe go home and get under the cover and do nothing. Whatever it takes for you to recover. See, the Sabbath was made for man, not man being made for the Sabbath. Friends, I'll confess to you, I know what it's like to live life feeling like you can't take your foot off the gas. I live there. I live in a life that is fast forward almost all the time. When you pastor a church like this, you work pretty much seven days a week. And that's not boasting or bragging. I'm confessing it, something to you. That I have lost the ability to rest. And maybe you're like this too. There are times if I ever do take a chance to rest, I feel guilty. If I'm not working, I feel guilty that I'm not working. And maybe you feel the same way. If you do, like today, if you need permission to rest, God just gave it to you. But God will do you one better. God doesn't just give you permission to rest. God gives you a prescription to rest. Stop, observe, appreciate, and recover. This is one of the reasons that Jesus came We've been talking about these great gifts that Jesus brings into our lives. The world can't give these things to us. Like we talked one week about time, how God teaches us to manage time and how God redeems our time in a busy world. We talked about how Jesus came to prove that he is the God who is, has unlimited everything and he is the provision for your life. We talked last week about the fact that God cares about your physical and mental and emotional health. And how important that is for you to be your best for his glory. In the midst of all of this, today we hear about this God who is built into his creation, who came and modeled for us in a very personal way, demonstrated for us this need for rest. The rhythm of rest. God gives you permission and he gives you prescription. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, all of you who are overworked and overstressed, all of you who are filled with anxiety, all of you who are just coming out of finals, all of you who are trying to hit deadlines before the end of the year, all of you who are chasing three-year-olds around the house continuously, all of you who are just tired and carrying more than you can carry, come to me and I will give you rest. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for being a God that cares about the way we rest. You know that we live in time and we live sometimes against time and we butt up against time in such ways that causes us to get stressed and anxious and angry and fatigued. And God, you're saying, but I've shown you, I've shown you how to handle that. I've shown you how to live this sort of life with a rhythm of rest. Work hard, but then stop and observe, and appreciate, and recover. God, thank you for showing us how to do this. Teach us to do, to do it better than we've ever done it before. Jesus, we commit this to you. We commit ourselves to you, and we pray this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Hey, friends, what we're going to do next is uh, the worship team is going to start by singing a song out over us, and we're going to take an offering during this time. It's something we do every single weekend. If you're part of the family, this is what we do to honor God and, and to be obedient to God. If you're not a, 
uh, a regular tender here. If you're a guest with us today, keep your wallet in your pocket. This would be a great time maybe for you to fill out that connect sheet, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate, let that be your offering today. We would have, rather have you come to receive than to give. But also, um, this morning, if you need to rest, maybe you could use this time to just to rest in God for a few moments. Maybe you can do that right there in your chair. Just close your eyes and just rest for a few moments. Maybe you need to come to the altar and get on your knees and say, God, I'm really out of rhythm. And maybe you could teach me, God, how to get back in the rhythm of rest and begin to think about ways. I know it's hard. We're right on top of Christmas. But this weekend and this week coming up and starting the new year, really leaning into this whole idea of a rhythm of rest. This altar is open for you. This time is kind of made for you. So I want your rest for a few moments in it.